We're, we're always, in a way, oscillating between dynamics and form. So, I mean, one way to do it is postmodernism is a great explosion of dynamics. It, it's a resistance to the formalism, not so much of religion uh, for them, but of modernity itself. That modernity itself, they thought, had become too formalized and needed to be broken open. Now, could you argue what you see on the streets of our cities right now is an explosion, very negative one, of too much dynamics? Or that famous interviewer that we've talked about, you know, the, the young six-foot white man asking people, well, what if I said I was a six-foot-five Chinese woman? What would you say? Oh, I'm fine with that. I mean, th th that's dynamics run amok. That's dynamics gone mad, right? Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the content director at Word on Fire. Joining us is His Excellency Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop Barron, always great to see you. Hey, Brandon, good morning. Great to see you. You know, it's good to see you digitally, of course, but uh, I finally got to make a trip out there to Santa Barbara a few weeks ago and spend some time in person. Usually we get together, I don't know, every, every two or three months or so, but yeah. with COVID, I haven't seen you in many, many Long months. Time. But I was out there with a couple of good friends of mine, Matt Warner, yeah. uh, who's the founder of Flocknode, and Josh Simmons, the founder of eCatholic. We were having a little vacation and we got to spend some time with you a couple different nights. And then uh, maybe a week after that, you had another illustrious house guest, a much more illustrious house guest, <laughs> Jonathan Rumi, yeah. who plays Jesus on the hit TV series, The Chosen. A lot of our listeners will be familiar with The Chosen. So talk about these visits. I'm sure it was a great treat having Jonathan over there. Oh, it was, but I love seeing you guys too. And I remember you know, the back porch of my house in Santa Barbara is kind of a lovely spot. You know, it's a yard and it looks up toward the mountains. And I think we put the lights on that night. And I think I was having my, about four times a year I smoke a cigar, you know. So we had a cigar and I think you had your pipe. And, but with these great guys, as you say, who were playing a, a serious role in the life of the church today. So it was a wonderful conversation. It was a great joy. And we had a chance to be together two times, right? And the second time watching some of the NBA uh, finals. With you, who's a great basketball man, and then um, uh, it, it was who's the, who was the great Josh. Josh was is a basketball coach, and so that was kind of a joy to watch with you guys. Anyway, so that was wonderful. But then uh, Jonathan Rumi came just last week, as you say, the star of the Chosen, which I've had the privilege of seeing. It's a great, great program. I highly recommend it. Um, telling the story of Jesus, and it's volume. It's season one of I think they're projecting seven or eight seasons. So there's still work to be done. And what a delight he was. Uh, really interesting guy, a whole range of experiences, a lot of fun to be with, spiritually serious man. So we had serious conversation, we had silly conversation, had a lot of fun. Um, so he was a delight. You know, Jonathan's kind of becoming incorporated into the Word on Fire orbit bit by bit. Um, he recently filmed a yeah. series of lessons for an upcoming right. Word on Fire Institute program we're working on. So more details on that soon. Well, one thing but I, I think discovered about him is he does the voices of the Simpsons. And I'm a big Simpsons fan. And so he was doing, I mean, really good versions of the Simpsons. So to see Jesus, you know, with the voice of Homer Simpson was kind of fun. <laughs> and it's it's surreal hearing him read the scriptures. I think you had like an Instagram video of you guys sitting out on the back porch and he was reading some prayers and some of the scriptures because after having watched Chosen and you've identified him with Jesus, it's it's like hearing the word of God proclaim the word of God. It's really kind of eerie. We know what it was. We had mass. When he got to my house, it was the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. And so we had mass in my little chapel. And part of the liturgy that day, there's a long sequence before the gospel. And it's this famous Stabat Mater, that beautiful medieval poem. And it's, uh, of course, in, in English translation. So he read that during the Mass, and it was so moving. And so afterwards, we said, would you mind doing that again, and we'll just get it on, on camera, you know? So he did, and just beautiful. Go on, on my Facebook page, and you'll find that. All right, well, let's shift gears into today's topic. It's a weighty one, kind of a higher-level philosophical conversation. We're going to be talking about postmodernism. It's one of the most important cultural movements of the last, say, half century. We're going to look at some of the key pillars of postmodernity, and then, most importantly, how Catholics should view and assess 
post-modernity. Um, we did a previous episode, Bishop, episode number 182 on mm. the Enlightenment, which was sort of the 17th and 18th century movement, which emphasized reason, science, humanism, and you could say the Enlightenment gave rise to modernity. Mm-hmm. But today we're going to sort of be discussing the next movement after that, that in many ways was a response to modernity, yeah. and it's come to be known as post-modernity. Now, fair warning, anybody who's gotten into the muck of post-modernity knows it's notoriously hard to define and grasp, and that's actually one of its major features, is this nebulous, you know, difficult to pin down uh, sort of uh, feature. But maybe first, Bishop, before we get into what post-modernity is, Give us a sense of the history that led up to it. What were the conditions that gave rise to postmodernism? Well, as you say, the modern movement. So think of people philosophically like Rene Descartes or Leibniz or especially Kant. Uh, in the political order, people like Thomas Jefferson. Uh, in the scientific order, people like Galileo and Newton. All those figures produce what we call modernity, which has a scientific, philosophical, and political dimension. And it, it's a movement that we're very familiar with in our country because of our, our founding. Our founding was very much part of political uh, modernity. Our great reverence for the sciences, which we certainly have in, in the West, that comes up out of the modern movement, if you want. Now, modernity is very complex in terms of religion because in some ways it does identify itself over and against religion. So there's a, there's a complex and, and sort of... Uh, uh, strained relationship between religion and modernity. That's another story. Post-modernity now, what comes after the modern, and it, I would identify someone like Friedrich Nietzsche as a certainly a, a forerunner of the postmodern, but it really gets underway in the 20th century. Um, World War I perhaps being a key moment in the emergence of post-modernity. Now, why? Because part of the modern self-understanding was with enough scientific reform, enough philosophical clarification, enough uh, political reform, we will produce the you know utopia. We'll produce the rightly ordered society. There was what we call the myth of progress associated with modernity. Like we just just keep making more and more progress. Then came World War One, and if if, you, if that didn't convince you, how about World War Two? If that didn't convince you, how about the Holocaust? That didn't convince you. How about the dropping of the atomic bombs? In other words. The 20th century gave us such a, such a series of blows to the myth of progress, you know? So science did arise, political reforms did happen, and yet utopia didn't arrive. In fact, in some ways, just the contrary. All of those, and then, you know, look at the whole scientific thing, too. I mentioned Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, the Holocaust too, people seeing, well, gosh, science in some ways made possible these great moral outrages, you know. For all those reasons and many more, philosophers began to say, I don't know about this modern project. I'm skeptical now of the myth of progress. I'm skeptical of the way the sciences are being presented. I'm skeptical of, of modern political reforms. And so the critical movement of post-modernity begins to emerge. And I would emphasize that critical element. Um, one reason it's hard to get to get your, your finger on it is it's largely a, a critique of the modern, post-modern, you know. Does it have its own substantial identity? Some people might question that. Its main thrust, it seems to me, is questioning a lot of the moves of modernity. So that's a little sketch of, of let's say, from the medieval and, and maybe just very early pre-modern Europe, and then into modernity, and then into post-modernity. All right, let's work our way through some of the major features of postmodernism. Um, I like this description from Walter Truett Anderson. He's an American political scientist. In 1996, he offered these four pillars of postmodernism. I want to list them out uh, real briefly, and then we'll talk about each one. So number one, the social construction of the concept of the self. So identity is constructed by many cultural forces. It's not something given to you. It's constructed. Second, relativism of moral and ethical discourse. Morality is not found. It's made. And I mean, lump all this under the broad title of relativism. Three, deconstruction in art and culture. And then four, globalization. People see borders of all kinds, whether they're geographic, moral, or cultural, as social constructions that can be crossed and 
reconstructed. So let's talk about each one of these uh, one at a time. So first, the social construction and the concept of self, that identity is forged through cultural forces and it's not given to someone by tradition or religion or some other source. Yeah, you know, look in the classical world and coming up out of the biblical tradition, there's a, a clear sense of a substantive human nature that the mind can discern. It has a certain structure to it. We're meant to uh, live kind of in accord with the demands of that nature. If you really want to press it, almost like a platonic form of humanity, of what we're you know meant to be, that comes up out of the Bible, as I say, and out of the Greek philosophical tradition, comes into the West, and it's certainly dominant throughout the uh, high Middle Ages. You know, a figure, Brandon, I think, and then I should say this, it's also still very much present in modernity. So you can't read a text like the Declaration of Independence without a sense of, well, yeah, Jefferson thinks there's something like a stable human nature. Now, maybe he wouldn't subscribe to every detail of Plato and Aristotle, but there's a sense of, yeah, there's something uh, real, objective, and substantive about human nature. And I think the, the great political reformers of the modern period would have shared that. Here's one of the harbingers of postmodernism is uh, Karl Marx. Marx says that human nature is nothing other than the sum total of our social relations. It's a famous one-liner from Marx. It's very interesting, isn't it? What's human nature? Nothing other than the sum total of our social relations. So is the human being under a, let's say, slave economy different than the human being under a feudalistic economy? different again from a human being under a, a capitalist political economy? Marx's answer is yes. There's no such thing as a stable human nature, but it's what we call human nature is produced by all the social relations that are concomitant with a given economic arrangement. So I think that Marxist move, now that would have been articulated mid 19th century, very much conditions uh, the postmodern conversation. Now, people like Nietzsche and Sartre, who would clear out essence in favor of existence. So I've talked about that a lot before, the, the primacy of existence over essence in Sartre, meaning my freedom, my self-determination comes first, and I determine who I am. Well, of course, then human nature is a fluid construct. It's a construct of my own freedom, or you might say of the, you know, the freedoms of a number of people within a cultural framework. They produce what we call human nature. Um, so yeah, they call it the destabilization of a once stable human nature is one of the marks, I'd say, of a postmodern. We'll get to some of the more contemporary manifestations of each of these postmodern turns later in the episode, um, but I want to continue just fleshing out the main principles. So number two is relativism of moral and ethical discourse. So again, morality is not found, but it's made or constructed. It, you don't get morality from religious traditions. It's not given by heaven. It's constructed by dialogue and choice. Um, is this, I would guess, you would agree, a prominent feature of postmodernity? It is, and it's... Um... You know, if I kind of tweak the nose of that principle, uh, it often leads toward a sort of meta-ethical view. And, and I can say more about that. But yes, beginning in people like Nietzsche in the 19th century, uh, a radical questioning of the received ethical tradition, uh, the primacy of the individual expressing his <clears throat> will to power. So it's not as though I'm, I'm conditioned by moral absolutes outside of me, but rather I assert my will in the kind of empty space opened up by the death of God. That's Nietzsche. In Sartre, again, it's existence preceding essence. In someone like Michel Foucault, a major player in the postmodern, is to see what we call ethics as usually a form of oppression. It's some group that's found itself in power and now constructs a social and, and ethical order so as to maintain itself in power. So postmoderns tend to, they, they pull back the curtain, they look behind what seems to be objective truth and value, and they see behind it usually some form of oppression. One group trying to oppress another. In the name of morality, so it's, almost every group will say, well, no, we're doing what's morally right. The postmoderns, um, I use the image of the Wizard of Oz, you know, the, the, the Toto pulling back the curtain to reveal this kind of grubby figure that's just pulling the levers. What looks so impressive, ooh, the Wizard of Oz, it actually is that little grubby guy behind the curtain. There's a lot of that in the way the postmoderns tend to think. Um, and so, yeah, relativizing of, of ethical values, for sure. 
All right, a third major feature of postmodernism is deconstruction in art and culture. And I think anybody, you know, walking through a modern museum of art, anybody reading modern literary criticism, excuse me, I should say contemporary to distinguish between modernism and postmodernism, will recognize this. Um, the focus is on endless, playful improv improvisation and variations on themes and a mixing of high and low culture. But um, the, the overall emphasis seems to be at least especially when it comes to works of literature that you know things aren't as they seem that we really need to expose and deconstruct the underlying motivations or themes talk about this yeah let me say a word about that because one thing brandon i do want to emphasize even as i'm critical of, of many themes in the postmoderns all these people i mean like foucault and derrida and sard and and uh, nietzsche and company I mean, these are brilliant people who saw something right and in fact, I wrote a book called The Priority of Christ Toward a Post-Liberal Catholicism. And I'm using liberal there as almost a, a synonym for modern. So a post-modern or post-liberal, there's something right in, in the postmoderns. They're seeing something. Now, they tend to push it too far. Yes, indeed, I think. But now, I'll give you an example here with um, deconstruction, which is a technical term in the writings of Jacques Derrida, who would be one of the main players, I'd say along with Foucault the main player in postmodern philosophy. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, it's, it's not just a negative thing, not just like a nihilistic, let's tear everything down. Rather, it's a deconstruction of the one meaning that a text has. So he feels that it's problematic to say, here's a text, here's what it means, here's the clear you know, significance of it. That what happens, Derrida thinks, is there's always well, my reading of it, and then you got your reading of it, and someone else's reading of it. In fact, I might go back a year later and have myself a different read. Now, why? Because meaning is a function often of the way the words play off each other, the way the ideas reflect each other in different ways. And so he has that famous, it's a, it's a, a play on words in French, différence. Différence just means difference, but if you spell it with an A instead of an E, différence, it means deferral. And the point there is that you never have the meaning of the text, but rather the fullness of meaning, you might say, is always deferred. It, there, there's always more to say. Now, and I'm trying to emphasize the positive side here because the Derrida, toward the end of his life, gave an interview I always found interesting, and someone said to him, all right, you're the father of deconstruction. Uh, define it for us. And here's what he said. He said, deconstruction means, viens, oui, oui, <laughs> which is French for come, yes, yes. And see, the point he was making was, uh, deconstruct, if you want, the, the meaning that's already there, that everyone sort of accepts, pull on a, a loose thread on it, look at it differently, see the way language can be played a different way, not with a nihilistic purpose, but to say, viens, come, is there another way to read this, a fresh perspective on it, you know? So I, I'd give it that positive spin. It's not just like, let's knock everything down and destroy all value. It's, I, I would say something like, um, you know, I, I'm a Newman man, and, and John Henry Newman, 19th century, with his keen sense of the development of doctrine, th there's something of, of that in Newman, the viens, oui, oui, right? Like, there's a, maybe another perspective, another angle we can see. And in the ongoing conversation of the church, all these different perspectives emerge. Now, maybe I'm giving Derrida too positive a read. I'm, I'm seeing him kind of through a Newman lens. But I think that's maybe a fairer sense of what he means by deconstruction. All right, so maybe if we summed up everything we've said so far in postmodernism, you might conclude that the results of postmodernism are that knowledge, truth, meaning, and morality are mostly culturally constructed and therefore relative products of individual cultures, but that none of them possess some objective, universal sense of meaning and morality. Would that be a good summary, Bishop? Yeah, I'd say in the more radical strains of it, as you press postmodernism all the way to its kind of illogical extreme, I think you do indeed come up against that. And again, see, here's the, I mentioned before the thing about metamorality. Here's what I mean. Is they're exquisitely sensitive, the postmoderns, to the danger involved in making absolute claims. So see, we can find that very liberating. Like, oh, it's true. Oh, thank God we found the truth, you know? 
yeah, there really is a human nature, and I really can order my life properly, and yes, there is a God, and yes, these values exist, that, that can be very liberating. They tend to squint behind that and see the oppressive potential. Oh, okay. I figured it out. I got the truth, and you need to know it. And if you don't get on board, I'm going to make sure you do coercively. See? So they're... they're Maybe you'd say hypersensitive to this danger, but the danger. I remember John Caputo. I don't know if you know that name, Brandon, but he's he's a great student of Derrida and he's um, a philosopher and, and sort of historian of philosophy. He always said, "Here's the danger: if you think you got the secret, then almost automatically you'll invent the secret police." <laughs> and that was his way of of advocating the Derrida position of like, okay. I got it. There's truth, and there's value, and there's human nature, and it's all in a row, and I got to figure it out. And if you don't get on board, I'll get my secret police to get you on board. Now, is that fair? We can debate that till the cows come home. But the postmoderns are like very aware of that danger. Uh, you know, Brandon, I always go back to my friend Paul Tillich, whom we've talked about, and I did my doctoral work on Tillich and Aquinas. But Tillich's famous distinction between dynamics and form, right? That both in human psychology and in our social arrangements, both of those things we need. Uh, dynamics, creativity, freshness, freedom, yeah, we, we, you know, the, what's fresh and new? But if that's all you got, then you get the shape of water, right? Then you get, well, everything's up for grabs and I've got no place to stand and no place to anchor my life. It, you know, viens, oui, oui can become debilitating if, let's say, hey, there's Nazism, viens, oui, oui, there's, you know, there's fa fascism, there's, I mean, come on, there's a limit to the dynamism of, of the new and so on. And therefore, we also reverence form, substance, pattern, meaning. Now, too much of that, indeed, you get petrified and you get locked in place and there's no room and yeah maybe the secret police begin showing up you know to enforce form and one of Tillich's great insights of course is that this side of the eschaton we never get this thing perfectly right <laughs> we're, we're always in a way oscillating between dynamics and form so I mean one way to do it is postmodernism is a great explosion of dynamics it, it's a resistance to the formalism, not so much of religion uh, for them, but of modernity itself. That modernity itself, they thought, had become too formalized and needed to be broken open. Now, could you argue, what you see on the streets of our cities right now is an explosion, very negative one, of too much dynamics. Or that famous interview that we've talked about, you know, the, the young six-foot white man asking people, well, what if I said I was a six foot five Chinese woman? What would you say? Oh, I'm fine with that. I mean, th th that's dynamics run amok. That's dynamics gone mad, right? So that's how I tend to look at these things is we, we do oscillate between dynamics and form and um, never quite getting it perfectly right, um, you know, but both values need to be uh, reverenced. You said earlier that we could maybe trace the origin of postmodernism back to around World War One, and then it kind yeah. of gained steam throughout the middle and tail yeah. end of the 20th century. Uh, do you think we're still in a predominantly postmodernist society today? I've read people who say, you know, the steam's kind of running out. Other people say, yeah, no, we've reached the fulfillment of postmodernism today. H how do you assess the cultural landscape? It, it, it's a cool question. It's hard to answer because uh, I think it's true that academically, it's, it has kind of run its course, that, that in a way, like all movements, you know, every movement reaches a sort of high point with certain great figures, and then their disciples begin just kind of tiresomely repeating what they said, and then decent insights get pushed to an illogical extreme. And, and I do think that uh, the academy, that's happening. My reading of what's happening on our streets is a lot of the postmodern Farrago that had been in the academy in the West since about 1970 has come spilling out. I mean, listen to the, the people making these demonstrations and so on. You'll hear a lot of the postmodern rhetoric. Um, so I don't think it's dead by any means. I think in some ways we're seeing vividly on display 
what has been taken in intellectually. But, you know, it's maybe the demonstrators on the street haven't quite realized that the intellectual energy behind a lot of that has, has in fact, run out. Um, what's next? People have talked about post postmodernism. You know, what's the next move? Um, I don't know. How about Catholicism? Yeah, well, and that's the bottom line, of course, is, is there this great collection of truths that we see within the Catholic tradition? And again, this would take us way too far afield, but I would argue that a lot of the great values that are reverenced by, the, by all these systems, you can indeed find within Catholicism. Think of the best of the modern, right? The rise of, of the sciences and rationality. You and I have said this for years. So that comes up out of the Christian universities of, of Western Europe. Uh, political reform. Behind Thomas Jefferson, there's Locke, sure, but there's also Robert Bellarmine. Behind both of those, a keen sense of, of human rights that are grounded in what? Endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. I would argue the best of the modern is, in fact, in Christianity. The best of the postmodern, same thing. I think some of the, the best instincts of it you can find within a, a healthy Catholicism. Now, does that mean we just retreat into the Catholic castle? No. Like Newman, you know, you go out uh, with confidence to meet the culture and say, yeah, that's good. Yeah, well, yeah, I can assimilate that. And yeah, we, we can. No, 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 no. no. That, that, that's too much. There, there is a primacy to Catholicism, but not a sort of domineering exclusivity. It's a, it's a rich cultural engagement as we move through these various periods. You know, the church has flourished. Look, in, in ancient Roman times, when we're under persecution, still the church was alive. The patristic period, uh, the time of Augustine, when there's a, still the remnants of the Roman Empire, the, the Dark Ages, then into the Middle Ages, which were Christian monarchies dominate, then the early modern, then now into modernity, post-modernity. And what's, what's the one institution that's, that's endured all this time but, but Catholicism? Upon this rock, I'll build my church. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful feature, I think, of, of Catholicism. You and I are both reading this book, which is titled Cynical Theories, kind of a pun yeah. on the idea of critical theories. And it looks at how activist scholarship has made almost everything about race, gender, and identity, and why the authors claim this harms everybody. The authors, I think, if I'm not mistaken, are both atheists, so they yeah. don't really have a religious axe to grind. Um, but talk about this view of critical theory, what it is, and how it emerged from postmodernism. Well, what I like in that book, I like a number of things about it, but the authors there represent, and they'll call it uh, by this name, classical liberalism. And what we've been calling modernity now in its sort of political, well, political and scientific expression, they would claim as their tradition, classical liberalism, which does hold to something like a, a, a permanent human nature, something substantive. They, they uh, will claim, therefore, Martin Luther King, you know, and his way of appealing to the best of our modern political tradition and the biblical tradition around some sense of a shared humanity. So King wasn't hyper-stressing how different we all are, but he was hyper-stressing our shared humanity, a society where we're judged not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. That's the language, I would say, of the Bible, but also of classical liberalism. What worries these authors, and I quite agree with them, is the tendency within more aggressive forms of postmodernism so to emphasize all these points of, of demarcation that we're actually hyper-emphasizing what, what separates us. And in fact, we have problematized almost completely the idea of a common humanity. In fact, the, the claim is that a common humanity is, is going to be oppressive, you know? They think, and I agree with them, that's a very dangerous space to be moving into because it's essentially conflictual and there's no strategy for resolving the conflict. That's each small group claiming its own uh, prerogative. Um, you know, so I, I agree with their instinct there that I, give me classical liberalism over this woke business, which is much more conditioned by the postmoderns. I'm much more at home with Jefferson and Locke than I am with, you know, Nietzsche and Foucault. Bishop, let's close with this. How should Catholics view and assess postmodernism? What are its benefits and what are some of its drawbacks? 
Well, you know, I, I'll make some an overarching remark, which is I always told my students this at the seminary. Remember when you're, um, as a Catholic, addressing the culture, that you're doing it from the uh, deck of a great ocean liner. You're not in a little rowboat. What I mean is we have this marvelous, rich, complex intellectual tradition that's been around for 2,000 years. We've sailed our way through all kinds of different cultural expressions. And so we do, we, we engage the culture from a, a standpoint of, of great strength. I don't mean arrogance, but I mean of great strength. We can look at the postmodern and, and not just run away in fear and, oh my gosh, they're threatening us. No, no, with, with great um, uh, confidence and, and a sense of, uh, of happy engagement. Um, I like the uh, certain elements of the postmodern critique of modernity because modernity in some ways stood athwart religion. That's another story. So in the measure that postmodernism questioned some of those moves, uh, I like it, I welcome it. Again, go back to the Priority of Christ, my book, and you'll see elements of the postmodern that I find very agreeable to religion. So I, you do it with confidence, you do it with a, with a strong sense of standing in a very rich intellectual tradition. Well, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. We take one every episode we get together, and we love hearing them. So if you have a question for Bishop Barron, send it in to us by visiting askbishopbarron.com. That's the website, askbishopbarron.com. Record your question, send it in, and we might pick it for a future episode. Today we're hearing from Crystal from Baltimore, Maryland, and she's got a really interesting question about why some people find it harder than others to believe in God. Here's her question. My name is Crystal and I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. My question is, is it impossible for some people to believe in God? It seems that some authors and poets, Robert Frost for example, try really hard to embrace Christianity or some other kind of creed, but are just an, unable to do so. Why aren't these people given the gift of faith? Yeah, it's a hard question. It's a good one uh, because you're putting your finger on a number of, of uh, puzzles. First of all, I, I would certainly answer no to the, um, to the question, is it impossible for some people to believe? I mean, that can't be right. If God wants all people to be saved, that it would never be impossible. He wouldn't create someone for whom it's impossible for them to have faith. So I wouldn't say that. At the same time, you're right in emphasizing the primacy of grace involved in, in faith. Faith is a gift, as we say. You can prepare yourself for faith. There are what Thomas called preambula fidei, preambles to the faith, and that's all these rational approaches to God that can open the mind and heart to faith. But it is, it is a gift, just as I've said, if, if you're to come to know another person with real intimacy, that has to come as a gift, right? You can't, you can't break down the walls of someone's heart. They can only open their heart to you. And that's what faith really means, is God opening his inner life to you. Does he want that? Yeah, it seems to me. Um, but then we're also up against, the third element here, is the mysterium iniquitatis, the mystery of, of evil or iniquity. Why do some people resist grace? And they seem to, you know, they seem to. And, and the moral order and even the intellectual order, is there a resistance to grace? Yeah, there, there seems to be. Um, can God overcome that? As I've argued many times, I hope so. I hope so. I don't know it, but I hope reasonably that God can uh, overcome all resistance that we set to him. So what I'm trying to do is just sort of surround that question with certain insights without saying, oh yeah, there's the answer, because I don't think we can answer it quite that clearly. Um, if, there's, if there's failure, moral or intellectual, it's never on, on God's side. You see what I'm saying? It's never because God withheld something. Um, it's on our side. Can God finally overcome that resistance? And, and Frost might be a cool example because I think you're right, someone that really wants to believe. I, I can't believe that at some level God is not going to respond to that desire, you know? And even though he might not fully get it or, or categorically understand it, that, that God is responding to that longing of his heart. At least I hope so. So that's a somewhat oblique answer to a hard question. 
Well, thanks for that great question, Crystal, and thanks to all of you for listening and watching. Listen, before we wrap up, I want to share with you the exciting news of the launch of Bishop Barron's newest book. It's titled Pivotal Players, 12 Heroes Who Shaped the Church and Changed the World, and it is a gorgeous book. It's full of colorful photos and artwork. Um, I think it's maybe the most beautiful book we've published next to the Word on Fire Bible. So you want to get your copy today at PivotalPlayers.com. And here's the good news. When you order the book, you also get as a bonus free streaming access to the final two episodes of our new Pivotal Players film series. These two episodes just came out. One's on St. Ignatius of Loyola. The second one is on Bartolome de las Casas. And you get free lifetime digital streaming access whenever you order the book. So total no-brainer, get the book, get the free episodes along with it. You can find it all at PivotalPlayers.com. Well, thanks so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, I encourage you to share it and be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel.